Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar um, on the future of Belarus, in which we will attempt to provide some interesting answers to the generic question, where is Belarus heading? Um, this event is organized by the Elcano Royal Institute in connection with the uh, Polish and Lithuanian embassies here in Madrid. So before we start, let, let me thank the Polish and Lithuanian ambassadors, as well as the Spanish ambassadors in uh, Warsaw and Vilnius. Um, and we're extremely fortunate today to be able to kick off um, with four very uh, interesting speakers. Our first guest, of course, will be uh, Svetlana Sikhanovskaya, who was with us here in December in Madrid uh, for what I hope was a, an interesting and, and fruitful uh, meeting. And after that, we will be hearing from uh, the representatives from the uh, foreign ministries of Lithuania, Poland, and of course, Spain as well. So Svetlana, without further ado, uh, can I ask you to um, open this session? And it's wonderful to see you again. I'm glad to see you are in good health in spite of this awful pandemic. So the microphone is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, dear Charles. Of course, I remember my visit to Spain. So, uh, dear Charles, dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's real honor for me to speak in front of you today. Thank you very much for initiating this discussion on Belarus. And it's already a second discussion for me at the Elkana Royal Institute. And since my, since my first visit to uh, Elkana last December in Madrid, uh, the situation in Belarus hasn't changed much. Uh, Belarusians keep demanding new elections and their regime's uh, only response is violence. However, it's harder to come across photos of beautiful uh, mass rallies in Minsk on the covers of the international newspapers, as was the case recently. But does it mean that the protests have finished? Not at all. Right now, the protest is horizontal and decentralized. Many local rallies, creative actions, and chains of solidarity can happen anywhere and anytime. The activity of uh, residential neighborhoods with performances, murals, and tea parties became one of the essential forms of the protest. Belarusians deploy incredible creativity to make their voice heard in the country with total political oppression. The heroism of Belarusians shall not be forgotten. Lukashenko hopes that uh, in a few months the world will forget about Belarus and business as usual will resume. But we cannot and we will not forget all the crimes committed by Lukashenko's regime against Belarusians. We cannot forget three journalists, Katerina Andreeva, Daria Chultsova, and Katerina Borisevich, who are facing criminal charges for telling the truth. We cannot forget Eduard Babalika, who has been in jail for over half a year for running his father's election campaign. We cannot forget Artyom Sauchuk, who has been sentenced today to four years for protesting against rigged elections. We cannot forget it, and we need to act fast. But uh, what the world and the EU can do for Belarus? First of all, we need the European Union and its united response. Only with our neighbors and international partners' help, Belarus can become a country where the rule of law, freedom of expression, and the right to fair trial are respected. The crisis in Belarus is not the concern of only our nation or our neighbors who have shown so much support, Lithuania, Poland, and Latvia. Uh, by the way, Vice Minister Adamienas, Vice Minister Pshidaj, on behalf of all Belarusians, thank you for your principled position. So the crisis in Belarus is a challenge for all in Europe, but it's also a chance for Europeans, including Spaniards, to prove that you are true to the principles of democracy. The uh, European Union shall send a clear message to the regime that they crossed the red line and there is no return possible to the previous status quo until Lukashenko is in power. All those responsible for human rights violations shall be included on EU sanctions list. 
all the businesses associated with Lukashenko's family shall be prohibited from keeping their assets in European banks. At the same time, I encourage all European diplomats in Belarus to continue helping people on the ground and showing their solidarity with the Belarusian cause. Thank you for being on the side of the people of Belarus during Solidarity Day last Sunday. Please use your power in international organizations for solving the political crisis and giving an impetus to the transformation of the Belarusian political system. I call on the EU to prepare a comprehensive plan of economic support for democratic transition in Belarus. And I'd like to, I'd like also to address to journalists, analysts, researchers, students, and all those who stand for democratic values and human dignity. Spread the news about our struggle. Take the patronage over political prisoners. Write letters to political prisoners in Belarus. Initiate discussions and events about our peaceful protest. Help document crimes against Belarusians. Launch your own initiatives to support us. It's never enough. The road towards democracy is often long and bumpy. And now Belarusians need your support on our path towards democracy. So be on the side of the people of Belarus and we will be there for you tomorrow. Thank you and long live Belarus. Thank you very much, Svetlana, and um, stay safe. We hope to see you again very soon, and best of luck. Uh, let me now hand over to Mantas Adamenas, who is the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs at the Lithuanian, uh, in the Lithuanian Foreign Ministry. Mantas is at the airport, um, and I know he's anxious to, um, to make it to his flight. So Mantas, thank you so much for joining us, and the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I apologize beforehand if I'm interrupted by flight announcements um, at, at um, some point. Uh, but um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for El Elcano Institute and, and for the ambassadors of uh, our three countries for organizing this. I think it's, it's a very important uh, topic to address and uh, a very suitable date to discuss it because uh, after tomorrow the day and the day after tomorrow, we'll know more, considerably more about the intentions of the one of the few remaining di dictators on, on the in in Europe uh, after the All People's uh, Congress in, in 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 Minsk, we'll sort of see which scenario is more likely to to take place. At, at the moment, uh, it's, it's very difficult to make any predictions because uh, one risks either either being sort of a, a Cassandra or. Um, of having a sort of self-fulfilling scenario uh, because uh, things are really very much in balance. And uh, uh, what we see most recently, and, with, and I note that with, with great sort of concern, is the sort of normalization of status quo, of increasing sort of repressions, um, protests which continue, uh, continue uh, regardless of uh, uh, cold and, and uh, violence and uh, mass arrests, but, uh, and are likely to continue. But, you know, uh, what is worrying is that the, the, the uh, regime of Alexander Lukashenko sees that, that as a sort of normal status quo, which can continue indefinitely, in, 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 in his opinion. So uh, I, I, that's why I think uh, uh, to avoid such scenario, uh, he, European Union has to act uh, uh, more uh, forcefully, uh, absolutely united in, in an absolutely united fashion, and uh, uh, adopt sanctions which really hurt. Uh, that's to say, not just sort of uh, uh, a few ornamental uh, figures around uh, around president, but uh, hit at the uh, centers of economic. Um, economic power and economic sort of income of, of, of the regime. Um, and that's the only way that we can uh, propel it out of the uh, situation which looks like sort of solidifying into uh, violent, uh, continuing sort of new normal, even though it's, it's very paradoxical to call that new normal, when uh, we, we have a sort of, uh, uh, within 30 kilometers from, from a European Union capital, from Vilnius, a country which is increasingly like uh, North Korea. And in addition to uh, examples quoted by, by uh, uh, Svetlana, uh, 
something which is sort of ludicrous in its sort of, you know, in its logic that was uh, drawn to my attention yesterday, is that uh, a girl was arrested for wearing a red sort of coat, because previously it was uh, having the flag, which was uh, incriminate, uh, in incriminable uh, offence, then uh, sort of uh, having uh, dresses of uh, Belarusian flag colours, and now it's sort of the single element, because apparently in some sort of uh, lurid uh, uh, imagination, the red can combine with two whites to create the, the sort of Belarusian flag. So that's already sort of an incrimination. The a, a color becomes an offense. Um, but of course, this is this is just one example from from very many. But uh, this is intolerable that this uh, can take place. And um, uh, normalization of of the level of violence is 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 really that is a great challenge for uh, for the European Union, and it's a test not only of our values but of our credibility. We, we cannot, uh, having said uh, 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 one word, to, to sort of not continue with, with, with the rest. Otherwise, uh, our sort of credibility as, uh, as a sort of uh, union of states, and which is consent for democracy and peace and uh, sort of preservation of human rights within its uh, uh, immediate neighborhood is very much in, in, in question. So what I suggest we should work on, on the uh, two track sort of approach. And one is uh, of, of increasing sort of uh, the heat for the regime with, with very well targeted and, and forceful uh, sanctions. Another is a plan for transition. That's to say a very sort of constructive offer to, to the Belarusian society uh, of uh, the, the plan that we have them and the assistance that we offer them in, in, uh, in, in sort of case of democratic transition. Of course, uh, everything is now in the hands of Belarusian society. Uh, we can only help to, 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 to make the case heard and to, to make the fight uh, uh, achieve its, its end uh, and uh, offering offering sort of what we can in, in terms of sort of both uh, uh, very clear message that uh, crimes against uh, human rights, crimes against uh, hum principles of, of humanity will not be sort of uh, forgotten, that there will be sort of a legal uh, uh, and judicial sort of evaluation of them uh, eventually. And uh, secondly, that uh, as soon as uh, uh, Belarusian, Belarusian society declares, uh, achieves uh, 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 transition, we'll be there to, to help with, with very concrete proposals that we uh, uh, that we have to offer. And since there is an announcement starting, I'll, I'll finish here and sort of hand over to, to my colleagues. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mantos, and have a good flight home. Um, so, uh, Marcin Prudek from the Polish Foreign Ministry, the microphone is yours, and thank you for joining us as well this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Charles, for, for having me, for organizing this um, uh, very important and timely event. Buenos dias. Very good morning to, uh, to everyone, uh, and especially to, uh, to Madam Minister Christina Garlach. I'm, I'm really pleased to see you again and to discuss uh, the issues which are very important for, for both of us, for the European Union and, and also for, for NATO, the regional security uh, and, and, the, and the current situation in, 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 in Belarus. I'm really pleased uh, since with Manta, Svetlana, Vitis, Hanna, we've been discussing already several times, but uh, um, you know, not yet with the, with the Spanish um, friends, so it's a very good sign of, um, of, of cooperation. Today's uh, um, webinar is yet, uh, I would say, another international expert uh, event devoted to, um, to Belarus and to future perspective um, um, for this country. The intentions behind uh, the series of uh, seminars initiated by Poland with cooperation um, um, with uh, Lithuania last uh, autumn um, and conducted with several um, different um, uh, partners, our closest partners, is quite clear to generate a broad public um, understanding and support uh, throughout the whole Europe uh, for the um, democratic, uh, democratic Belarus. Uh, understanding of processes that are happening in the EU's eastern neighborhood in Belarus and recently around Belarus, uh, we have, as we um, have seen what, what happened recently in Moscow, St. Petersburg, is important for, um, uh, for all of us in various dimensions, political, economic, uh, security, and also um, um, human. Mandas uh, um, said a bit uh, about this, and uh, let me let me start by summarizing main elements of the um, of the Polish of our perspective uh, of the uh, situation. First and foremost, uh, civil society is absolutely crucial for the transformation of um, of Belarus. The cliches we uh, had earlier that. 
Belarus and are the most Sovietized um, uh, people in the post-Soviet uh, uh, world. That there is no strong perception of Belarusian nationality. Society is passive and um, public activism is um, weak. It was verified by this heroic people's um, movement we've been witnessing um, uh, since last uh, um, uh, August. Belarus has started a process that cannot be stopped or uh, revoked. No matter how brutal the authorities um, are, massive awakening uh, is an asset that nobody can um, take uh, away from um, Belarusians. Second, as Belarusians stand up for their dignity and for you know, democratic values um, uh, that are uh, actually the foundations of the, of the uh, EU, uh, democratic community has an obligation to um, uh, provide uh, support. Uh, and we try to do it, uh, I would say. Of course, we need to do a bit uh, more, but we've done, uh, we've done a lot. EU redefined its policy and priorities uh, towards Belarus, relocated financial resources to support civil society, um, 25 euro, million euro spent on this, uh, on this purpose, on this uh, goal, and sanctions were implemented uh, against uh, 88 persons and seven uh, entities. Of course, probably it's not uh, uh, enough, but at least we've started the whole um, uh, procedure. We will continue uh, that policy uh, of restrictive measures, uh, both against persons and um, entities, if that would be um, necessary in the, in the future. But there cannot be any doubt that violation of human rights will be um, uh, punished. Poland, together with VIFO partners, proposed the adoption of an economic plan which could be offered to, um, to Belarus once a democratic um, transition has started. So this is the plan for the new democratic um, Belarus. We need to give them a uh, kind of perspective, a constructive, positive uh, perspective for the, uh, for the future. Uh, as I said, it's a part of a positive agenda um, for um, Belarus in democratic um, uh, uh, transformation. The idea was accepted by all the 27 member states. Uh, and we do expect that the EU Commission um, presents this document uh, very, um, very soon. Many countries have individually recalibrated the, the support. As we got my country, we've been implementing a set of concrete uh, measures to help the Russian um, opposition, as well as ordinary uh, people fearing persecution, like humanitarian aid, uh, facilitation of visa processes, educational offer. Our comprehensive support uh, is implemented under the Solidarity Plan with Belarus worth 12 million um, euros. There are um, many international institutions uh, which can be used to exert um, additional pressure on, on Belarus. Uh, and I think UN and especially OECE um, uh, wait for their role in solving uh, this, uh, this crisis. And I do believe that also the Human Rights Council has still potential to be, uh, to be used. Uh, and it leads me to um, a very um, a final, uh, a very important uh, issue. There is a need to create a, uh, a, a accountability uh, mechanism for a systematic gathering of um, uh, uh, documentation of the most serious human and, uh, rights violation and uh, abuses in, um, uh, in Belarus. There would be, um, uh, they would serve any uh, future independent criminal investigations and criminal uh, proceedings. Uh, there are different options on the table. On, on the one hand, we explore the possibility to create an accountability mechanism within the Human Rights Council, um, uh, parallel to the special rapporteur uh, on, uh, on Belarus. And on the other, we work on the NGO um, led platform supported by a number of, um, of willing um, uh, countries. And thirdly, events of 2020 led Mr. Lukashenko to isolation from the West, further dependence on Russia, and cutting off perspective of support from Western financial um, institutions or even Chinese investments, since uh, the uh, unstable uh, political situation is not the best guarantee for business, uh, even for Chinese, uh, for Chinese um, um, business. Russia has also proved not to be willing to subsidize Lukashenko's regime economy and to support him at any uh, cost. Of course, they offered him a political um, support. That's why he survived, uh, I would say, the, the, the first wave of, uh, 
uh, of, of those protests. But financially, there is no money in the Russian budget either, and the Russia is facing its uh, own internal um, um, problems. So, uh, uh, but of course, Moscow confirmed its interest to uh, in keeping Belarus in Russia, uh, Russia's security um, zone. And let's uh, uh, face the truth: of course, the Belarusians are not uh, asking for any geopolitical change. They just are fighting for the dignity and the internal change of their own country. It's not a geopolitical um, shift. So they will definitely Belarus will stay um, quite close to Russia with a good cooperation with uh, with Russia. But what they're asking for um, is the support in the uh, in the change for a more democratic uh, um, democratic um, um, system. So a way out of the crisis, of course, is not easy. But there are some uh, inevitable elements which would be uh, would make it um, achievable. Belarusians' demand for um, uh, for change will not disappear definitely, and Belarusian authorities are in necessity to respond to this uh, constructively. Otherwise, they 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 risk that uh, protests will um, return return since uh, once the uh, winter um, is over. It's quite obvious that the people will uh, uh, will come back to the to the to the streets because the the spirit of freedom is still there and the, and the desire of dignity is still there. Nothing has changed. The way out of the crisis leads only through respecting human rights. The democracy and through launching a genuine inclusive uh, dialogue between the, um, the political establishment of Minsk and the people um, uh, and the nation of um, of, uh, of uh, Belarus. New election, elections as demanded by the civil society are an opportunity for all sides um, of the conflict uh, and they could open a door you know, for peaceful conflict um, um, uh, resolution. Tomorrow in Minsk, the meeting of all Belarusian People's uh, uh, Congress starts. That's the um, uh, Congress uh, organized by Mr. Lukashenko. Its goal, uh, set by, uh, by Mr. Lukashenko, is to strengthen its role in constitutional um, uh, reform. Experience makes us approach uh, these um, gestures uh, with, uh, with caution and questions their true um, intentions. Ownership of internal process, if, uh, process in Belarus belongs to Belarusians, including in those who think in different way than uh, authorities. Uh, with regard to relations with official means, and any minor gesture from authorities will not change the, the attitude of the EU and other allies as conditions for a uh, detente between Belarus and EU relations are clearly defined, and um, they yet haven't been. Uh, met. Poland strongly believed that OEC could and should have an important uh, role in, um, in conflict. Uh, we have a, a, a Swedish championship uh, at this very moment. The next year, uh, Poland is taking the lead, so we'll definitely cooperate with our Swedish partners uh, this year and the next year. And we ask also for um, uh, um, uh, um, more uh, involvement of all the all, all other partners uh, uh, throughout this, um, uh, this um, uh, platform. And last but not least, the EU must not stop uh, uh, halfway. This is also the EU's responsibility to show to Belarusians what the EU is all about and that our determination is not weaker than the, um, the one of the Eastern, um, Eastern neighbors. Um, we should uh, serve as a, with, a, with a, a power of example. I'm using the Biden's phrase. I mean, we are the community of democracies. We should give them the um, perspective rather than dealing with the autocrats and finding a way of uh, a sectoral um, um, co um, cooperation. Um, and that should be the, the, the way the EU uh, um, uh, should follow. So I would, put, I would put the full stop here if there are any, of course, uh, further questions and um, discussion um, during the discussion. I'm very open to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for those uh, very interesting thoughts and for providing some specific proposals, which I think is exactly what we read uh, what we need right now. Um, Christina Gayak, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for inviting me to, to this uh, event. Um, I want to start by, by really praising the great company that you have gathered, uh, uh, Marcin, 
and uh, mantas, uh, you know, providing us extremely good ideas uh, on the way ahead. But I want to in particular underline uh, the presence today and the role of Svetlana. It was uh, only six weeks ago, not more, that uh, she was here in Madrid. She had an amazing uh, um, exposure both to the government, she was with us in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I spoke with the president of the government, a great exposure in the parliament, a great exposure with the civil society through you, Charles, and through many other key leaders of our civil society. And I think we learned all of us so much about her, about her leadership, and about the amazing role of the civil society that she represents. Uh, the manner in which the media portrayed um, the ambitions, the fight, the courage was uh, extremely positive. And I was very proud myself as having supported her visit to, to Spain for the first time, that um, I think the whole Spanish society welcomed the fight of the civil society uh, in Belarus. Of course, our two countries are quite far apart. We are not Lithuania or Poland. You are so close. You know each other very well. You, you are constantly intertwined. We less, although we have quite a vibrant uh, group of expats from uh, Belarus. We have about 5,000, which uh, are mainly young individuals that have chosen to, to work here because uh, it's uh, um, a good opportunity and they are extremely active and we try to support them as much as possible. So I think the first point is from Spain, the uh, awakeness that uh, in terms of uh, her presence, it meant the visit to, to us. Second, um, where, and more concretely, trying to answer your question, where is Belarus heading? We would like, and we will do as much as possible, and we will work with the EU friends and partners and uh, a key in, in, this, in these activities like, uh, like uh, Poland and uh, Lithuania, and of course the civil society, to ensure that Belarus heads where the civil society, the people of Belarus wants. And I think this is our responsibility now to find where do we work? How do we organize our tactics? I think the first thing is uh, to ensure that norm the current situation does not become the normal situation. I think this is very important. It's winter, it's very difficult, but despite of that, we see the courage, we see the mobilizations taking place. So no normalization possible, because that would be uh, diminishing uh, the strength. Second, uh, um, pressure, uh, uh, pressure uh, um, uh, upon the leadership. And I think what we are doing in the European Union in terms of sanctions and in terms of mobilization, marching, you mentioned a number of ideas in, in the international organizations, the role of uh, the United Nations bodies in terms of human rights, uh, observations, rapporteurs. This is really important to ensure that uh, pressure is maintained and uh, pressure is conducive to what we all want, which is stop of the repression, ensure the freedom of the people that are um, jailed, and the conduct of new elections. And number three, for us, I think it's very important, mainly because, uh, uh, as Charles knows very well, we went through a political transition and uh, we uh, needed to, to be organized and at the different levels of our civil society. I think our role has to be 
in order to ensure that Belarus goes to the direction where the civil society wants, as Svetlana and the women leaders and many other leaders in Belarus are, are, are showing us, that we give all the possible support to ensure the robustness of the civil society movement, not to lose an opportunity, not to miss an opportunity to talk to trade unions, talk to youth organizations, talk to entrepreneurs, talk to business, talk to those that are experts uh, from our countries and uh, in Belarus on um, institutions, constitutional experts. Um, I think if we are able to amalgamate different layers of key individuals, key structures of the civil society, and uh, uh, help them in uh, becoming more robust, in ensuring that the institutions that will be born after a transition, which has to happen sooner or later, are institutions that can deliver the policies for the uh, society, for the Villaras people. I think we, we can do a lot. On our side, uh, um, and this is already a fantastic, uh, a fantastic way to mobilize because we will learn from each other the different uh, uh, positions. We are um, not only ready, we have already started uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, organizing uh, uh, a sort of uh, an exchanges on how to um, uh, look at experiences of transition in our in our country and uh, what could be um, of good uh, um, practices for the friends of colleagues that unfortunately um, live outside the country in Poland in in uh, Lithuania but also individuals inside that are leading the fight so uh, I think this is very important to be able to offer as matching opportunities for support as possible. Last uh, weekend, the mobilizations were highly uh, um, visible in our media. Um, we, in the ministry, uh, officially supported uh, the mobilizations. And uh, in that front, uh, the uh, good structures that the European Union has that has been using in many instances the European Endowment for Peace and uh, the European Peace Institute, etc., can be very good catalyzers. So uh, uh, the the leadership is there. We see Svetlana and an amazing team of women that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, risking, but also in a very imaginative way, keeping the strength uh, around. Uh, leadership is there. The EU commitment and the colleagues know is there. Um, we need to put more pressure on the regime and we need to ensure that we mobilize and partner with layers of the civil society to ensure it is a strength to deliver the path where we want Belarus to be, which is where the people of Belarus wants to be. Thank you very much for having me. I hope this is not the first, but the, 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 this is not the only one, but the first of many other events of this kind so that we can interact and learn better. We are um, far physically from Belarus, but very close to the people of Belarus. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, and, and thank you for stressing how important uh, Svetlana's visit was in December. Uh, she is a very um, unassuming, modest person, and perhaps I, I, you will forgive me, in fact, for not having addressed her as Madam President-Elect, <laughs> which is probably how I should have addressed her. Um, uh, she is much more than just leader of uh, democratic Belarus, as, as we all know. Well, thank the th thank, let me thank the three of you. Um, very much for your very interesting contributions. And as Christina said, um, Spain has an enormous experience um, in this field because of our own transition to democracy. I myself um, have tried to contribute to the literature on transitions to democracy. I've lectured in about 40 countries all over the world, basically talking about the Spanish experience. Um, Poland, of course, um, was one of my favorite 
places to visit in this context, given some of the similarities between the Spanish process and your roundtable talks. Um, but I've also talked about the Spanish um, example in, in Lithuania. And um, as, as Christina was saying, I think, in fact, if anything, uh, the European Union today is, is in a much better position to contribute and to assist a, a country such as Belarus um, in moving towards democracy than it was when Spain uh, faced those challenges back in the 70s. Uh, so let us be optimistic um, and let us think of creative and interesting ways in which we can um, help our friends in Belarus. So thank uh, all of you and, and please uh, feel free to, to stay with us, of course. And I'm now going to move on to the um, expert panel uh, because we thought it would be interesting to bring together um, experts from, from different countries. And But before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Mila Milosevic, who um, is a senior analyst here at the Elkano Royal Institute, as a transitologist, um, if you will bear with me for half a minute, um, I just wanted to, to raise a couple of ideas which might be useful. First of all, um, conceptually, uh, you know, when we talk about democracy and transitions to democracy, I think we should look at five uh, phenomena or five, um, five issues. Um, first of all, the nature of the existing regime um, in Belarus, in this case. Is it a totalitarian regime? Is it an authoritarian regime? Um, what are the internal dynamics? And that is very important because depending on the kind of non-democratic regime that we are facing, this will partly determine the kind of transition that is actually possible. Secondly, the role of the state. As we all know, um, there is no democracy without a state. Um, and one of the characteristics of totalitarian systems is that the state and the regime are basically one and the same thing. They are very closely intertwined. And therefore, uh, when the regime collapses, the state collapses. And that's basically what happened in, uh, uh, in the former Soviet Union, for example. In authoritarian regimes, however, like the Spanish one, there is considerable autonomy between the state and the regime. And therefore, uh, the regime can collapse, but the fundamentals of the state, uh, of what Juan Linz used to call a usable state, uh, remain in place. Although, of course, that state has to be reformed in order to adapt it to the new democratic circumstances. Thirdly, obviously, soci the society in the, of the country itself. Um, how developed is it? Uh, what are its structural characteristics? Fourthly, of course, the economic structure. Um, how viable is a free market economy uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a country of this nature and what needs to be done uh, to ensure its viability? And finally, uh, the international dimension. Um, I hate to boast about my work, but I suppose I pioneered the field of, uh, uh, I was one of the people who pioneered the field of the, the, the literature on the international dimensions of democratization. To what, to what extent does a favorable international environment play a role? And as Christina was saying, um, in the Spanish case, for example, the European Parliament, even though Spain, of course, was not a member, that's the whole point, the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, uh, the German party political foundations, uh, European trade unions, all of these actors played a very prominent supporting role. Let me also turn to um, another sort of conceptual um, tool, which I think might be interesting. And that is one that was provided by a very famous Spanish political scientist, sadly recently deceased, uh, Juan Linz, who taught at Yale University for uh, over four decades. And he also talked about the five spheres of democracy. And he used to argue that democracy is basically a work in progress. And those five spheres are, first of all, civil society. In other words, um, you cannot have democracy with, without an autonomous civil society. But interestingly, he also stressed, secondly, the importance of economic society. In other words, the rules that regulate uh, the free market economy. And, that, and, and it's important to remember that even in the most uh, liberal of free market economies, rules and institutions uh, are very important in making that free market economy possible. Thirdly, political society. And this is an issue that I would like you to raise perhaps in your conversation, because what I have detected, for example, in, in my visits to Ukraine um, and elsewhere, is an idealization of civil society and a demonization of political society. In other words, 
It's cool to be part of civil society, right? This is what everyone wants to be, uh, you know, youth movements, it's neighborhood associations, etc. But people are much less anxious or much less favorable when it comes to becoming involved in party politics, because to some extent, you know, political parties are tarnished, they're old fashioned, it's a 20th century thing, or maybe even a 19th century thing in some countries, right? So we idealize civil society to the detriment of political society. But of course, if we want to build a representative democracy, we will need to have political parties because we haven't invented a better way of representing uh, political pluralism. Um, so the importance of political society, which Juan Leith stressed, I think is very relevant. And of course, this also includes things like electoral laws, uh, which are already being debated in Belarus, uh, constitutions, um, the balance of power between executives and legislative and, and the judiciary. Uh, fourthly, rule of law. Um, of course, we all know that rule of law, that there cannot be democracy without rule of law, but they are not one and the same thing. You can actually have elements of rule of law without being a full, a full democracy. Uh, and this is something that I think has to be explored. And finally, um, statesness. Do you have a usable state? Do you have a state, uh, fundamental state structures, which will be, for example, capable of raising income tax? Because if you can't raise income tax in a manner which is perceived as being legitimate and fair and efficient, then uh, your, your economic problems will probably get much worse. Okay, so forgive me, um, I just wanted to share my... Uh, some of the things that have been on my mind when I when I listen to people talking about Belarus. So without further ado, let's move into the second part of this session. Um, and I will first hand over to Mira Milosevic. Um, as I've already mentioned to some of you, Carmen Claudine, who is going to join us from Barcelona, who is a dear friend and colleague, is uh, sadly suffering from a bout of lumbago. Um, so she is lying down somewhere comfortably, I hope, in Barcelona. Uh, following this uh, debate, which she would have very much liked to have taken part in. So without further ado, Mira, the microphone is yours. And thank for all of you for joining us this morning. Good morning for everybody. Thank you very much. And um, it's very difficult to, to, to me now to speak after this uh, magnificent <laughs> speech about the transition and uh, after the two vice ministers and, and our secretary of state. But I, I have to, to highlight it that I'm very happy that we uh, have uh, uh, opportunity to feel the support of our political elites in, in, uh, in uh, one issue as, as the, the case of, of, uh, of Belarusia. I mean that this support of, of the political elite is very important in this case and uh, for many reasons, but above all because uh, they are representatives of the countries of the European Union and uh, uh, European Union have to be one of the most important pillars of the transition uh, to democracy in Belarus. Uh, I think that Charles had to be the first advisor of this process, but we will see. We will see. Uh, we will see it. Uh, I agree what what they said, but um, just I would like to make a few remarks. In my opinion, the future of Belarus's. Um, political system depends mainly on three th factors. The first one is uh, Lukashenko's strategy to stay in power. The second one is uh, opposition's ability to capitalize on popular discontent. And of course, uh, Bill depends a lot on uh, of the support of Western countries, above all of the United States and, uh, and the European Union. Uh, I, I know that Hannah will, of course, talk about the, the future of the opposition's uh, actions against the, the Lukashenko regime. For that, I, I will focus on, first of all, on uh, to make, I will make a few remarks about the, uh, Lukashenko's strategy to stay in power. Also, I, I think that we have to, to understand it. Even uh, I agree that now he would like uh, to maintain the, the status quo. And uh, finally, I will make some remarks how uh, the European Union uh, could help 
more uh, Belarusia. Even our Secretary of State, Kristina, uh, really uh, explained it uh, in, in, uh, in, in much details. Um, it's obvious that Lukashenko uh, would like uh, to stay in power, to conserve the status quo. Uh, it's also obvious that uh, to achieve this goal, uh, he has at his disposal all the instruments of the state security forces, of the KGB, the intelligence services, the policy and the army. And also, I think that is very important to, to, to highlight it, it, is that he asked the Kremlin uh, the, the Russia, the Vladimir Putin, for for support. Um, there is evidence that since the beginning of the protests, Kremlin experts as well as media experts have been coming to Belarus to to advise the the regime. They are still there, and uh, also I think that the Vladimir Putin's public statement on uh, Russian state television that he has special forces ready to support the legitimate government of Alexander Lukashenko. The Kremlin has no particular interest in him personally remaining in power. It's uh, uh, the, the support of Russia uh, aim to, to uh, maybe the Kremlin will, will agree with the other government it can control. Uh, but what is the most important for, for Russia is to prevent Belarusian uh, re uh, reproachment uh, to, to the NATO uh, and, of course, to prevent the Belarusian civic awakening from infecting the Russian society. Uh, given the political opposition to Lukashenko stressed is in many occasions that this is not a geopolitical revolution, uh, but a re revolution for freedom and respect from, for human rights and against violence, Belarus's uh, reproachment with NATO is, is unlikely. So uh, I think that now uh, for the Kremlin, um, the one of the main problems is, is the Navalny case, of course, and I think that this case will show whether Russians are catching the democratic uh, virus of, of Belarusians. But um, I, I think that the Kremlin will not overreact. Uh, Russia has learned in Ukraine. Uh, a new military intervention would be politically and economically inconvenient for, for the Kremlin. And of course, uh, there uh, is a lot of strong... Uh, uh, th there are a lot of uh, strong links between the Russian and Belarusian society uh, and the Kremlin uh, will not uh, put in risk uh, this, this uh, close, close relationship. And uh, to, 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 to conclude, uh, I, I just would like to, to highlight that the European Union really uh, have to help. As Charles told, the transition is work in, in uh, progress. Political change in Belarus has only just begun. And as we know, the road is made by walking, as our poet uh, Antonio Machado used said. And uh, the international community should do what it can to accelerate the Belarusians' march towards uh, freedom. I think that, uh, that, that maybe the European Union uh, have and could help uh, with, with more support with advisors for transitional process, advisors for changes in, uh, of constitution, and of course uh, have uh, to support economically more independent media and civil society. I will stop, uh, stop here and uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amida, and we're doing quite well time-wise, so perhaps um, after you've all shared your initial thoughts, we can uh, come back to you um, with some additional issues. So let me now invite uh, Hannah uh, Lubakova to take the microphone. She is a journalist and a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. 
Um, we heard today about the repressions, but I'd like to still remind everyone about what's happening in Belarus. Um, by now, more than 32,000 people have been detained during the post-election protest. Thousands have experienced police violence and torture, and now nearly 240 people are recognized as political prisoners. These numbers uh, may sound as dry statistics because while well, the scale of repressions is so enormous, but behind these numbers are real people with real stories. And if we look at the um, at the people who are who have been detained, who have been recognized as political prisoners, these are businessmen, these are miners, the elderly, academics, bloggers, an ex-banker, a musician. Representatives of nearly every social, professional, and age group are behind bars. And yesterday, um, two brilliant journalists, Katerina Andreeva and Daria Chuntsova, my friends, were on trial. They are facing up to three years in prison for just live streaming from a rally that was brutally dispersed by, uh, by police. So during the court hearing, they, the two of them remained in a cage. And you know what they did? They smiled and they showed a victory sign. Um, how symbolic it is. Um, it's a truly Belarusian phenomenon um, um, of the really remarkably nonviolent protest. After the election in August, when the information, when, when the information about um, um, unimaginable police brutality became available for, for people and reached basically the majority of the population, Belarusians um, did not attack the police in revenge. Instead, they uh, hugged them, uh, they gave them flowers. Um, ordinary citizens who dream of inclusive democracy initiated this revolution. And the way they resist matters in the long run. Um, Charles, you mentioned this, uh, you know, civil society power, um, the future of democracy in Belarus and basically the future of Belarus. And um, uh, that's a truly democratic resistance, I would say. After all, uh, the people in Belarus are fighting for their human and civil rights to be respected for the new free and fair elections for justice. Belarusians are building the new basis for a future vibrant democracy. In my opinion, Lukashenko is the best vaccine against authoritarianism, against populism, because now Belarusians just, just know what they do not want to have. Um, that's why uh, uh, the people of Belarus are looking at Europe for help and example. And we mentioned the example of Spanish transition. Um, so here, uh, it will also be crucial for, for Bel Belarusians. Um, despite all the violence, all the lawlessness, uh, people in Belarus continue coming out to the streets every day. Um, I recently heard from, from, from someone from Belarus uh, that uh, the repressions now um, are even worse than in August because now people are just being kidnapped for wearing um, you know, white and red trousers or holding a flag of Japan because uh, it also has you know, white and red colors as the um, national flag of Belarus. Um, the format now has changed, but again, it's not necessarily worse. Activities in local uh, neighborhoods give this um, experience of horizontal connections this kind of very practical, very concrete self-organization um, on a local level. And this feeling of community and self-governance is important for mobilization now in spring, uh, but also for building democratic institutions in the future, because people just feel that they can take matters in their hand and they can uh, decide themselves. Um, and we've talked about the, uh, the civil society, um, the wave of solidarity and self-organization, again, is unprecedented in, in Belarus. Uh, strike committees have been formed at state enterprises across the country. Um, even though police are arresting and, and, and firing workers and, and intimidating them in any possible way, students gather on university campuses to protest repression and censorship, even though they are being expelled from universities and taken to, to military. Uh, lecturers support them. Um, media outlets uh, publish blank pages when uh, journalists, photographers were arrested. There is uh, this you know, immense solidarity and basically um, uh, res residents you know, in those um, local neighborhoods, they, they feel um, um, 
proud of, of uh, you know, belonging to, to, to this, you know, certain uh, neighborhood. Um, and that's uh, how this, you know, feeling, um, this value of self-identification is being born. Um, and um, what else is important is that um, um, alternative structures of society are being created at the moment. This is to the point about this um, future, right? Um, and and um, what's going what's gonna to happen if uh, the dictatorship is destroyed, whether the state will be destroyed. Here I'm more optimistic because, well, these structures that, that uh, the pro-democracy movement and civil society organizations are creating right now, uh, citizens are forming themselves. Um, these structures will eventually take over the, uh, the, the current um, uh, dysfunctional politics. Um, and those dissidents, uh, uh, those um, civil society activists, when there is less control, when, when uh, they have a chance, they will um, um, become, you know, political candidates, perhaps. Uh, they will perhaps create political parties. So uh, this is to show that um, that Belarusians are already part of the European family. Uh, they do respect the the European Western um, values, and, and they've already made their choice. Um, now the task for pro democracy movement is to preserve the infrastructure on the ground to to kind of address the needs of different social and professional groups of uh, you know groups of uh, society, and also uh, kind of include those who have been undecided or not ready to go out in the streets and it should also include elites and law enforcement um, and again i still see here a chance because this system is not monolithic um, the european union obviously has more tools to influence the regime in belarus sanctions uh, need to be consequent need to be targeted and need to be painful this pressure, um, uh, we, are t we are not talking about sanctions just because we want to impose them, right? But this is kind of this pressure is needed to force Lukashenko to agree to dialogue and eventually organize new presidential elections. Um, when it comes to assistance, uh, what I've been observing now and what I think needs to be changed is that it should avoid bureaucracy. It should be uh, faster because people need support now. Um, and kind of the third um, idea and the third important field is, is justice. So Belarusian, Belarusians need justice. It's important that European governments create a, a coalition of countries that will investigate police crimes, establish an investigative body that, that would do that. Um, and, and just to conclude, um, I've, I've, I truly believe that uh, uh, Western countries have a historic opportunity to bring Europe together and fight dictatorship by supporting democratic aspirations of Belarusians. Thank you very much, Hannah. That's very interesting. Let me, by the way, just say, you know, um, on the whole, we, we think that the Spanish transition was a great success, but there were aspects of the transition uh, of which we are perhaps less proud. Um, and for example, we had no transitional justice. In fact, the concept transitional justice did not exist in the 1970s. It was coined um, you know, afterwards in, in Latin America, in South Africa, and so on. So some critics of the Spanish process um, rightly point out, you know, that Spaniards also have to be modest about some of the shortcomings of, of their own process. So I, I hope I, I wasn't giving you the impression, you know, that we wanted to lecture you or impose our model on anyone. Um, but I think it's interesting just to compare different models and different historical experiences both from your experience, from the Spanish experience, but also from the mistakes that were made. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, let me now uh, hand over to Kamil Kaczynski, um, who is at the Center for Eastern Studies at Warsaw. I think we've never met in the flesh, Kamil, but thank you very much for joining us. It's a great honor and a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, this is my debut on uh, Spanish ground uh, in Madrid. Uh, very interesting experience. Uh, as I have only five minutes, I would like to give very short forecast, uh, attempt to, 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 to give some forecast, some prognosis for this year. We are asked as an experienced and a professional, let's hope, experts uh, with long experience of analysis, what will happen in this year? This is a very difficult question. Maybe I will start from... Uh, 
points which we know for sure. We know for sure that Lukashenko lost the support of the majority of his uh, society, of his uh, compatriots. And it's obvious that uh, he uh, is not able to uh, rebuild uh, this trust, uh, this support. A majority of Belarusians are at least discontent. This very soft uh, description, a discontent with uh, or unhappy with uh, uh, authorities. We know for sure that authoritarian regime is strengthening. Uh, Lukashenko understands that uh, he has only power, he has only force and violence. He has no uh, other uh, positive, let's say, um, arguments to convince uh, people to, to stay with him. So uh, as we have, as, as he has only one choice, one one way, he will uh, he will strengthen further and more and more uh, repressive, um, oppressive measures, uh, restrictions uh, towards the society, towards uh, towards uh, the people. What we can observe now, what we know for sure that Lukashenko has only one ally. This is Russia. This is very difficult ally, very dangerous ally. Uh, but paradoxically, this ally could be only one chance to survive this uh, this year. I will come to that later. W what we know for sure also uh, that Lukashenko is isolated from the West. Uh, at, at this stage, we have a quite uh, a comprehensive uh, approach from from the West that Lukashenko is no longer a partner, a credible partner for negotiations. What we don't know, we, we don't know how hot it will be this spring. Uh, of, of course, I use metaphor, but we understand what what I mean. Uh, how massive uh, demonstrations will uh, will be? Uh, how how many people will go on the streets in Belarusian cities again after the quite hot summer and hot uh, uh, autumn last year? This is very important factor, much more important than the Western sanctions, sanctions, which are of course a very very important task for us, and uh, this is our our. Um, uh, homework to develop sanctions further maybe but we should be modest and we should understand that the major factor is not external from our side from the west but internal uh, what means uh, how 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 tough and how desperate people will be this year fighting with the regime. Uh, this is very uncertain thing, and I think that the first exam of readiness of, of people, uh, of Belarusian people, will be in March. Uh, it was, of course, uh, mm, a day, day of um, the Belarusian independence, this independent day, independent uh, celebration of Belarusian independence at the end of March, on the, 20th of the, or the, or the 25th of March. Uh, it will be first exam, first uh, check uh, how how many people are ready, despite growing repressions, to go on the streets. Lukashenko has only one positive factor, despite violence, which couldn't be a positive factor as itself, uh, which could help him to survive this year. This is Russia. At the end of uh, uh, the last year, I would claim uh, something co completely different. At that time, we understood that Russia uh, decided to change Lukashenko. They uh, exert quite strong pressure on uh, Minsk, on, on especially in issue of, con of constitutional reform. They expected that Lukashenko will organize a re referendum about, about amendments to constitution. And after that, maybe it was quite uh, probable at that time, early elections. But but now, uh, at, the, at the beginning of this year, in the first quarter of this year, we can uh, count, um, mention at least three factors in uh, looking from Russian point of view, which could hold this process. And now we observe even change in agenda uh, between Minsk and Moscow. Uh, there are uh, following factors. First, of course, this is arrest of Mr. Navalny uh, and uh, all those unrests uh, which, which are uh, de uh, uh, developing in uh, Russia, in Russian cities. Now, Russia has uh, maybe not the same difficulties as uh, Belarus had last year. It's not the same scale of, uh, of protests. Uh, could be f further, but at this time, it's not the same scale. But anyway, first task is to keep stability and to fight with a disease as as they as they used to say disease of revolution of uh, social unrest so this is a very important connection be between those two um, regimes in moscow between putin and the uh, regime in minsk uh, of course between putin and lukashenko second factor is um, uh, 
Russian elections to Duma, parliamentary uh, elections in autumn, which especially in context of Navalny would be a very difficult task and any changes and the difficult, uh, and, and difficulties uh, and the conflicts between Moscow and Minsk at this, at this time would be very inconvenient. Uh, I would like to remind that officially Belarus and Russia are in a union state, they are allies and they would like to present, especially Moscow needs that now uh, in case of PR of propaganda to to present cooperation and friendship between both presidents, even between Putin and infamous, even even including in infamous in Lukashenko. And third factor, which is also very important, military exercises Zapad, which will be organized in autumn by Russian, Russian military exercises. Uh, taking into account those three factors, I think that Lukashenko has a chance to survive this year as an uh, infamous, but anyway, acting dictator in Belarus. But there is one uncertain thing, which I mentioned before, scale of protest. Uh, but to be uh, at the end of my, of my speech, uh, I would like to also remind that majority of experts uh, until the August of last year, also including me, uh, thought that uh, 100,000 or 200,000 of demonstrators on Belarusian streets, for example, in Minsk, it's enough to overthrow the uh, regime. Uh, Belarusians exceeded this uh, this limit, and so now now we understand that uh, maybe uh, it's not enough, and and to uh, to um, force uh, Lukashenko to, to to step down is needed much more than we believed before. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Campbell, for that very detailed and I must say very convincing um, analysis, and for. Um, highlighting some of the events that we should be looking out for. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let me now turn over to Vitis um, Yukonis, who is at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm very glad to be here. And I want to say one thing, Belarus really didn't appear like in August 2020. And uh, though for many actually, especially the politicians, somehow they noticed that Belarus and especially Belarusian civil society exists. But there are lessons which should have been learned from 2006 and 2010. Uh, and, and reacting to what Camille said, it, there's a question, what do we need? To, like in 2006, 2010, experts like Camille and the, the others like were saying 10,000 is not enough. We need hundreds of thousands and now we have hundreds of thousands. So what would be the next estimate? Do we need a million in the street? Three million seeking refuge in Poland perhaps? It's not enough at the moment to have tens of thousands fleeing to Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, Latvia. I think we need to be, even being experts, we need to be much more sensitive about what is happening in, inside Belarus. Secondly, Charles mentioned different phases of transition. And theory is nice. Uh, I, I think there's an ambition to plan. Um, and I think it's understandable knowing how tough transition is, knowing the experiences of like Spain, like Baltic countries and all of that. Uh, but, uh, and it shows that we genuinely care for Belarus, but it shouldn't be for us to an excuse to do nothing. I mean, saying that, well, it's so unpredictable, things might get even worse. So, so we need to say that IMF, World Bank, EBRD, bilateral uh, partnerships were there for 20 years and more. And we wasted that already, like working, cooperating with Belarusian regime. We were misled, we were cheated. And, and, and that should be put on record saying that basically why waste our energy coming back to, to some sort of dialogue with Belarusian regime if it's cheating? Uh, so the third point is the opposition. I've heard that uh, phrase a number of times throughout this discussion. And one thing which needs to be mentioned, we need to separate opposition and civil society. Um, just 
these are two different things. Opposition is fighting for power. Uh, civil society is not found fighting for seats, for power. They want to have a choice, the right to choose. You know, they want to change the rules of the game, but not necessarily speak, uh, seek for any positions. And when we speak about the opposition, their experience, what we ought to understand that most of them were never ever in power or they were in power like at the parliament uh, decades ago. Most of them are operating underground. People like Statkevich and Severinets, I think lately spent perhaps more time in jail than practicing governance. Yeah, so, because the essence of the regime is not to hold, is to hold the monopoly. And we need to say very boldly that entire Belarus and Belarusian people were the hostage of this authoritarian like uh, rule. Uh, and it's, I, I believe it's wrong to even say or use the word conflict because there is no conflict. There is a person who took the entire country as a hostage because of his like personal ambition, who is oppressive uh, very much so. And I think the only thing which is like showing energy and is vibrant at the moment is civil society. It's showing the muscle. We cannot really predict the scenarios like, but I think everyone uh, in the international community owes Belarusian people a possibility to choose their destiny. And that's what important. Uh, the protests so far revealed the systemic human rights abuse, uncovered also the myth of so-called multi-vector policy, which was never ever the case. Again, we were misled and continue perhaps some of the experts to be misled by this imitation of so-called multi-vector policy. In general, the situation is a huge test for international community and like countries like Spain, Lithuania, Poland, because uh, it's a matter not only about the dignity of the Belarusian people, but also of our dignity, honor, and principles. Uh, Belarusian people are asking to bring back the choice uh, to them. That's what we should and what we must do. As uh, Mr. Like Shidash said, to not stop halfway. We basically uh, announced and declared and admitted that uh, there were no elections, so they were falsified big time. Lukashenko is illegitimate. So the logical next step is to actually say that uh, like we need to organize free and fair elections as soon as possible. And given that the, Sweden is at the presidency of the OSCE at the moment, I cannot see any like better moment to actually have this impartial international observation mission. And uh, I think focusing on things which like uh, were mentioned already, international community, I think that uh, the response was there. The UN Security Council, area meetings twice, OEC Moscow mechanism launched, sanctions three rounds, like some financial commitment, Mm, and visa support for those who are fleeing or humanitarian corridors. Svetlana Sikhanovskaya, as you mentioned, was in Spain, but also I think that she had over a dozen of international meetings, uh, visits, and even more so meetings with the, the leadership, presidents, prime ministers, ministers, like uh, dozens of countries, I think getting close to like 30 countries or so. So, but what uh, we keep forgetting, and I think that the like, um, the like, uh, the secretary mentioned it right, free and fair elections. And the ambition should be not to follow the scenario of Moscow, which suggested perhaps elections in 2022, but actually say that it needs to happen now Realistically speaking, given all the experience of the OEC, I think May 2021 is a realistic scenario. Uh, I mean, unless we don't have an ambition and unless like mm, our concern is more words, selfies, you know, resolutions perhaps, uh, we need to bring back the choice to the Belarusian people. We owe that to them. And I think that should be our main goal and focus and everything else, including sanctions and economic support, these are just instruments to make sure that this uh, 
promise like is fulfilled to the Belarusian people because that's what we what they were demanding uh, in August in September they keep demanding it and I think that we owe that to them otherwise basically we can throw international inter the entire international commitments and principles to the garbage bin by saying that you know like that we don't have leverage I, I think that Whatever the case is in terms of these geopolitical speculations that, first of all, Kremlin needs to agree on this uh, and things like that, I think we need to be very vocal that this is a must, even if that's very hard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, it is for that reality check, an impassioned reality check, um, which is as it should be. Um, you mentioned the word dignity, and that reminded me, you know, I was an idealist once, and I stood in the streets of Cairo, um, and I saw Mubarak fall, and I thought, well, obviously, you know, Egypt is going to be a democracy. <laughs> and here we are uh, with a regime today um, under Field Marshal Sisi, which is actually even more brutal and repressive than Mubarak's. So that's my reality check. Um, and that's also why I mentioned this dichotomy between civil society and political society, when you, which you picked up on when you mentioned that the opposition and civil society are not one and the same thing, and you are absolutely right. Um, my, my, my reaction to that would be, you know, again, in, Turk, in, in, in Egypt, I saw this very vibrant civil society with a pathetic opposition, um, you know, the complete absence of political leaders, um, complete absence of, for example, a convincing secular uh, leadership, or even a moderate Islamic uh, leadership capable of moving the country forward towards democracy. And the result, of course, was that the uh, that civil society later also collapsed um, and is now um, unable to operate autonomously. So that I, I just wanted to come back to, the, to you because, uh, but, but thank you very much for, for stressing um, the fundamental issue here, which is the wishes of the uh, Belarusian society, which we should, of course, keep um, very much in mind. Can I come back to Hannah again, and, the, and hopefully Vitis and others will forgive me for being a social scientist. Um, but, you know, basically there are three kinds of transitions or three kinds of scenarios that we can envisage. One is uh, regime change through the overthrow of the existing system, right? And this normally requires mass mobilization. And I was interested in your, uh, in your remarks, Camille, as well, about the resilience of the regime. So regime overthrow can come about through a combination of internal mobilization and external pressure. That's one pretty classic scenario. A second scenario is uh, internal collapse, implosion, basically through regime systemic failure, very often associated with economic failure, right? So if, if Lukashenko's regime is basically, I, I guess it, it still has some legitimacy in some sectors of society, probably not much. Um, but if that, um, if that legitimacy is related to performance, then if the regime's performance is abysmal, which it would appear to be, then there is perhaps a scenario in which you have um, regime collapse, implosion, right? And then the third uh, scenario, which is basically the Spanish scenario, uh, to some extent the Polish outcome as well, is uh, what one political scientist has called transition by transaction. In other words, some kind of negotiation between the people who are currently in power and the opposition, which of course needs the support of civil society if it is to be a credible opposition. So I would ask you, Hannah, given your knowledge of your country's um, politics and, and what you hear on the street and what you see every day, um, which of those three scenarios do you think is most likely? Uh, look, analysts usually say that, you know, there have to be all of these scenarios mentioned, um, you know, so that we are not uh, mistaken. Um, and of course, so, none of the above is a good answer, by the way. <laughs> so that we can also save our reputation. Um, well, I would say, um, 
you know, the pro-democracy movement is aspiring and it's kind of willing to have these negotiations and this dialogue with the representatives of, of, of the current government, not necessarily Lukashenko, but, you know, whoever is capable of, of uh, taking part in this negotiation. So that that's kind of the ambition. Um, and dialogue is something, um, you know, national, genuine, inclusive dialogue is something that we all have to aspire for because this is something that is kind of more substantial and this is something that um yeah would include all different you know parts of society and that's something that would ensure that this change is profound um um indeed right so i would say that um uh, the, the kind of the main obviously difficulty is how to achieve you know and how to force the representatives of the regime whether these are um elites, you know, law enforcement and, and the uh, power vertical that, that Lukashenko has built to take part in this uh, dialogue, to take part in these negotiations. Um, and here, you know, we have, uh, you know, all these kind of proposals from, from, from this um, external pressure, meaning sanctions and all these different, you know, kinds of pressure that uh, the Western countries can, um, um, can do, can, can uh, kind of contribute, but also internal pressure. Um, these are, you um, protests, obviously, these are all different formats of how people show their discontent, their dissent. Um, and also kind of this uh, internal economic sanctions that, that people are applying, uh, which is also very interesting. They just mm. stop, you know, buying products from um, companies that are associated with the regime. Um, I, I do not have a um, one answer. Um, we have to consider each of these scenarios. We have to be prepared. Uh, we have to prepare people also for, uh, for for those scenarios. That's why I really believe and I really think that the current pro-democracy movement should address not only those who are active and who are already decided, but also those people who, um, according to the sociological research, um, want to change. The majority wants change. We know that. But not everybody is uh, willing to, uh, you know, kind of demand this change, change proactively. <laughs> So here more work should be done and um, uh, we have to definitely be prepared for um, a kind of perhaps longer, um, um, you know, period of, uh, of this peaceful fight. But, but it only means that, uh, you know, this, this change will be, um, um, will be more substantial, will be more fundamental because it's obvious that there is no longer any way back to the old status quo. Sorry, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, Baitis, would you like to jump in here? Yeah. And please, Camille and, and Mira, we have time for a very brief final comments from you as well. Please go ahead. I think it's like very natural that none of the scholars like uh, or experts uh, like to see any alternative because that was the essence of the regime to get rid of any alternatives, right? So I think that uh, the beauty of Svetlana's story, basically a women tri trio, is that you know, for years, Lukashenko was undermining the potential of the country. So when, like, you ask, like, what's the alternative? It could be a housewife. It could be a minor. It could be an IT guy, you know, and that's the beauty of the civil society energy, saying that there are multiple alternatives and we don't know them until they appear. So in this, uh, I think that there are multiple scholars and people who are very capable, like uh, who worked abroad, who have European education. And this is not going to be an overnight change. Some of the people who are like working with the regime, they will remain in power. We are not talking about this super revolution. All the three like uh, scenarios that you mentioned, it's gonna be something in hybrid scenario in a way. But what we need to acknowledge that this dialogue scenario, which was proposed from the very beginning by the civil society, it's neglected, it's uh, by the authorities. They are trying to uh, jeopardize it, to imitate it. And we don't need to um, uh, fall into this trap. This is very important. The other thing, which is like my um, focus so much on the elections is that we are not betting here on people. We are betting on principles, and that's what we should do. It's not that we are saying that this guy should be the president of Belarus, but it's like we are betting on free and fair elections. And, you know, if Belarusian people under free and fair conditions choose 
someone like Moldovans at some point chose Dodon or Ukrainians at some point chose like Yanukovych, it's their right. We are not Kremlin. We shouldn't be controlling the process, but we need to make sure that there are fair rules of the game. And that's the obligation of the international community, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, there's, there's a very interesting article by an American political scientist called Thomas Carothers called The End of the Transition Paradigm, which was published in 2002. And I don't want to be a spoiler, but one of the things that he objects to about the transitology literature is that we have exaggerated the importance of elections because, of course, elections um, have a limited transformative power. I mean, I'm not saying that elections are not crucial to democracy, uh, but again, this is something that Democrats need to take into consideration, you know, that um, as you mentioned, sometimes former authoritarians win elections, but but that's legitimate. Exactly, that's legitimate because it's democracy. Thank you. Um, so, Camille, would you, and then and then uh, Mira. Uh, just very shortly, uh, we should be uh, realistic. I think once um, Russian people, as they showed in, in recent year, they are not ready to go out from peaceful format, uh, peaceful formula of protest. They are not ready to fight uh, with a uh, regime. They are not ready for bloody revolution. Alexander Lukashenko is not ready, of course, to resign from his power uh, so far. And he is not uh, able also to regain trust from, from, from the majority of citizens. And Russia, which is a very important factor and player on this field, is not ready, not interested to resign from influence in Belarus to exclude Belarus from zone of exclusive uh, influence in uh, the closest neighborhood, as they used to say. So we should we should took all those factors uh, into our under our considerations. And I think that uh, this country needs compromise. Only a candidate, only elections, which will be a result of negotiations, and which will take into account. Uh, Mm, expectations of the street, of Belarusian street, peaceful street, what, what, what is very important. Expectations of nomenclature and expectations of Russia, uh, only, only in this terms, under, under those uh, conditions, is uh, possible and uh, uh, beginning, only beginning of a very difficult uh, transition of, uh, of Belarus. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, um, just last very, very by no means least. Higher, higher <laughs> very away. short comment. I know we are out of time. I I, uh, I was about to talk uh, just of uh, this difference between the formal democracy and substantial democracy. I was born in former Yugoslavia, and I see how is easy. Uh, to to make context for formal democracy, and I am sure that the the civil society of Belarus will achieve to to make uh, this year or next year uh, multi party elections. But that is only the start, and uh, the the real danger is that the. Um, the, how the regime would like to show that it is not possible to change the regime on the street. The elections here are, of course, are very, very important. But the true challenge is after the elections, and the true, uh, true danger is to conserve a really uh, substantial democracy and not to become imitation of democracy. I will stop here uh, and thank you very much for all uh, these very interesting inputs. Thank you, Mira. Um, so it's 11.30, so we are spectacularly punctual. Um, Spaniards are very punctual, by the way, contrary to popular myths. Uh, as are Lithuanians, Poles, and Belarusians, um, and former and former Yugoslavs. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm not going to attempt to summarize what has been a very interesting and very rich debate. Let me just thank our three officials, our three representatives from the foreign ministries of uh, Poland, Lithuania, and Spain. And as I said at the beginning, let me also thank our ambassadors. Spanish ambassadors in Lithuania and in Poland, and the uh, Polish and Lithuanian ambassadors here in Madrid for making this event possible. And let me thank um, all of you, you speakers, for your very interesting views. I'm informed we've had about 120 followers, um, which is nice to know, um, given the time of day and, and, and other limitations. 
And I very much hope that we can meet again soon. So thank you all. And for, the, for those of us, for those of you who are listening in, um, this recording will, of course, be available on YouTube in a few minutes' time. Thank you very much. Um, good day to you all. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.